terms, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the greatest of the lot. It ends with a 10-ton car hurtling across the American desert at 763 miles per hour. It's traveling faster than its own sound, in almost total silence, until... This is the inside story of Richard Noble and his mission. To build the fastest car on Earth and break the sound barrier. It's May and Richard Noble and his team touch down in Jordan in the Middle East for the all-important tests of their thrust car. Money and time are running out and they have just four weeks to prove to themselves and their sponsors that their extraordinary design actually works. It's a really great moment. We had crises after crises after crises. Hi, how you doing, man? Good to see you. But we've done it, we've actually got here. So I can't tell you how good it is. Yeah, of course we got here. It's taken many years and several million pounds just to get this far. Almost bankrupt, team leader Noble has gambled everything on proving his car is capable of even attempting the sound barrier later in the year. We've got a number of enormous problems actually coming our way now. Well, the most single important thing is that we get the car up to 600 miles an hour, possibly beyond, but certainly 600 miles an hour. That gives us credibility, that proves that we've got a car and a team and a driver that's a viable contender for, of course, the big battle in America. It's vital they prove their car quickly because they have a rival. American Craig Breedlove, who is ahead in the race. His car has already got within 100 miles per hour of the sound barrier, a speed the British team can only dream of. But this is dangerous and unknown territory. On Breedlove's last run on the American Black Rock Desert, his car suddenly flipped on its side and careered off course at 670 miles per hour. God almighty. Miraculously, it righted itself again and Breedlove was unhurt. Now he's rebuilding for the battle with Noble in the autumn. While Breedlove fixes his car, Noble has one extra time to catch up. But the American desert is now flooded for the summer, so desperate and with nowhere flat enough to test the car, Noble has turned to the local knowledge of his supporters club. I was here in the army 50 years ago, and I used to travel across here twice a week with a tanker full of water to take it out to our base camps. So when it was mentioned to me at the motor show that they couldn't run it because they had nowhere to run it, and I said, well, I know where there's a flat desert. And Richard said, really, where's that then? I said, in Jordan. And Richard said, Jordan? That's not too far. And I know the king. I thought to myself, gee, I hope I've done the right thing. I hope it's still the same, because my wife said, they've probably built a block of flats on it. Noble's team arrive in the scorching Jordanian desert kingdom weeks behind schedule. Summer is coming, and the temperatures are rising daily. In a few weeks, it will simply be too hot to test the car. First task is to assemble all the high-tech equipment to run a supersonic car. The headquarters is a converted supermarket lorry with air conditioning, satellite links, and of course, the basics. Tin tomatoes, bread, eggs, cheese, all the tin fruit that we can eat. Noble has assembled an all-British team of 30 many of whom are taking time off work to share his dream. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to be involved in something historic like this. Um, I'd do whatever I had to to be here. It's something you can always look back on to and tell your grandchildren or whatever the case. It's, it's a piece of history. Personally, I'm not that interested in land speed records. 
but a lot of people have said this isn't possible, it can't be done and I really like proving people wrong. <laughs> to take the risk of driving his car into the unknown, Noble has chosen RAF fighter pilot Andy Green. It's a world first. It's tremendously exciting to actually be a part of the team that's actually going to go out and do something nobody's ever done before. <laughs> Green fought off 29 other applicants, including some of Britain's top test pilots, to win his place as Richard Noble's driver. It was a wonderful moment when I was uh, announced as the driver and uh, the, uh, Richard gave me this uh, huge great key fob with this key dangling on it. And Later on, this, um, one of the spectators there came up and he uh, had his six-year-old son with him and said, can my son have your autograph? And I'd been hanging on to this key because it was the only proof I had this had really happened to me. And I said, well, I can't sign with this in my hand. And I gave it to him and I said, hold this, it's the key to the most powerful car in the world. And he held on to this and he looked up and he sort of, and there's just a look of awe in his face as he looked down at this thing. It's just incredible. I thought, yeah, that's the power that this project has. Richard Noble was one of Andy Green's heroes. You know, I can remember when uh, Richard Noble broke the world land speed record and I saw it on TV and I read about it in the papers. I thought it was amazing. The incredible part is that Richard, with no preparation at all, got into a jet car, taught himself to drive it, broke the world land speed record. Noble's record of 633 miles per hour, set 15 years ago at the Black Rock Desert, Nevada, has never been beaten. What they discovered later was that if his car had gone just seven miles per hour faster, it would have taken off, and Noble would have been killed. Despite his brush with death, Noble still dreamed of going supersonic. He knew he would need someone to design an extraordinary car. After years of searching, finally in 1992, he ran into Ron Ayres, a retired missile scientist. I said right at the beginning to Richard, this is totally impractical, don't even try it. Ayres had a lifetime's experience working on supersonic missiles and luckily had a love of the land speed record. I only actually carried on working on the project um, more out of curiosity, if sometime some idiot should uh, uh, try to travel supersonically, what should the, uh, uh, the car look like? His revolutionary design was for a ten-ton monster with two jet engines, a long thin tail and a radical wheel arrangement. The great danger is, as the car reaches supersonic speeds, it will catastrophically flip into the air. They needed to test the design. First, they spent weeks on computer simulations, checking if their car would stay on the ground. They found a shockwave. A huge wall of energy would build up in front of the car. Although the computer said the car would survive, Ayers demanded a second, more practical test. The second method was to repeatedly blast a rocket-propelled model of the car down a test track at supersonic speeds. Four, three, two, one. Oh. High-speed photography and sensors all over the model should tell them if his design would stay on the ground as it went through the sound barrier. It was a gamble. Only if the detailed results of the computer and the model tests matched exactly would they dare to go ahead and build the car. I can remember very clearly um, plotting the uh, results from the computer analysis against the, uh, the results from the rocket sledge and seeing this amazing correlation it is the one time in my life I have ever shouted Eureka. <laughs> <laughs>